Hi, my name is Will, and welcome to the Distorted Transmission uh, for uh, for today. I'm talking to Booger Beasley from Head Like a Hole, direct from Wellington. How are you, Booger? I'm good. I concur. What do you get? Has, is, it, is it a cup of coffee or a cup of tea you're drinking? It's coffee. Coffee. It's to be like first of couple tonight. Perfect. So I've got a bunch of questions. Uh, I hope you don't mind me asking. The first question I'm going to ask is... Um, I would imagine at this point that the Rock 2000 at Spark Arena has been cancelled. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah. The Spark Arena gig, I think it's cancelled. I haven't heard exactly that from Live Nation, which is sort of a little bit unprofessional on their part. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking. Go away. I'm just joking. Yeah. No, but, but truthfully, I haven't heard a confirmation that it, it is not happening. Um, so I'm going to email them tonight just to say, is it definitely not happening? With the lockdowns and everything up here, I would say the, the, the odds of everything being open to the point that you can have a Spark Arena gig is pretty, I mean, it's yeah. pretty much cop, uh, nails in the coffin that I would say. Slim to nothing, eh? Like when we first were talking about this, I said he'd like a hole would be happy just playing a toilet, um, and I popped the kibosh on it. <laughs> It's a head like a whole curse. Yeah, I don't uh, curse them. That's what COVID is. It's the head like a whole curse. We've been dragging our feet for years trying to work out whether we're still a band. And then just as we decide to do something, um, you know, the COVID hits and then there's a whole year of doing nothing and then we decide to do something again and then it's big COVID hits again. You've recently released a track called Demons, and you mentioned on your band camp that you had some input from a long-time head like old fan, Bridget Powers. How did that come to pass? When I was up in Auckland to have a rehearsal two years ago, because this has been two years in the making just to get one song recorded, um, Andrew was going bang, 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 almost playing the intro to Metallica's One. And um, and I, I was like, oh, I've got nothing. I've got nothing, you know, like, and then I got this email, bing, you know, while I was just sort of hanging in the practice room and there's Bridget Powers and she sent me like three or four poems. Hey, Booger, just, you know, big head, like a whole fan. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm sending you some poems and shit. And I was reading through them and then there was one called Demons and I read through it and I was like, are these terrible or really good, you know? And then, hey, it ended up they were really good because Andrew was playing that riff and he was like, you got anything for this? Just sort of, you know, mumbled, and I was like, no, no, not yet, sort of thing. But then it just came to me, holy shit, those lyrics, the the, the poem Demons. So I started singing that, fit perfectly, and it was just the verses, really, because the structure was different back then, and I had the chorus wasn't there. The chorus only happened the night before we recorded. Wow. Because that's how ridiculous it was. We actually had a Zoom meeting with the band to say, let's play some shows, and it went from let's play some shows to playing some shows and then we'll have a rehearsal, finish off writing some songs and go into the studio to stuff playing some shows. Let's just go into the studio. And Nigel was like, no, we can do this. And I'm like, yeah, I, I understand that. But it's good to be prepared and know where the song sits and stuff. So in the end, we just made a decision, you know, rather than being dead in the water, let's just try and get the ball rolling by going into the studio, maybe the magic will happen and the night before. That kind of happened on 13 because you guys were sort of unprepared for that. We actually had those songs written and we'd play through those songs religiously for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, you know, which we don't really do anymore. Right. <laughs> it's difficult when three people live in Auckland, I live in Rao Maddy and Mike lives in Wanganui. You can't rehearse every week. You can't rehearse every month. You can't rehearse every few months, it seems, at the moment. So, right, okay, yeah. I've noticed that, like, some of the new head like a hole has kind of the shadows and contours of old head like a hole, but with some sort of added darkness and sort of weight to it. Maybe it's just my yeah. interpretation. But if it's accurate, would you attribute that? Well, what would you attribute that weight to? I just reckon it's a different band, you know. Like it's me and Nigel. Uh, ultimately, me and Nigel started the band but it was four dudes that contributed to the head like a whole sound back in the early days. And then when Tom joined, you know, it's sort of 
transformed or metamorphosized into something else, you know, because he's a great guitar player and, and him and Nigel fed each of, off each other quite a lot. And then, you know, we did W Strength and, you know, the Kiss It All record. And that's where the Heat Like a Whole sound really sort of became embedded. You're also older as well. So I, I suppose m- maybe you, you, you've got more sort of, of life's weight bearing down on you more than you sort of than back when you were in your early 20s. Truth be told, I've been sort of thinking um, he'd like a whole is sort of pulling in different directions. I want to do, I like singing rock songs where, you know, the music's blaring and it's like our live shows. I want to be singing over some fucking stinky music, you know, but I just find that of late um, a lot of the stuff's been quite tame. Right. And, and, I, and I've been trying to say to Nigel, dude, we should be listening to the back catalogue because we really need to be playing some energetic riffs, you know, yeah. energetic I mean, I, music. I did notice that myself. I mean, um, like the sort of the new Head Like a Hole is a lot more, I don't know, calm or more sort of moody than the, 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 the old stuff yeah. that had a lot of like raw live energy. But yeah. on even even Blood Blood Will Out, which, which you sort of came back into the, you know, into the, into the scene with, that had a lot of energy on it as well. Um, yep. Perhaps not quite as much as uh, you know back when you were twenty, obviously. But but the but, but the songs had had a lot of um, sort of I don't know, sort of just sort of raw raw energy to them. Narco Corridor, for example, is a little bit more reserved. I don't, I don't know. I find Narco Corridor a little bit lumpy. Right. <laughs> it's my description. Is that I think there's um, I really love um, Credence, which mm. we never play live. That's my favourite song. I think that song is classic head like a whole. It's got a fat driving bass riff. It's got a really simple drum beat taken from a rehearsal that I recorded on a cassette and then I used the kick and the snare from the cassette and just said, use that, bro. It's all digital. There's no there's no amps, nothing. It's all digital amps, digital drums with some crappy kick and snare and it's the best sounding song on the record. I believe you've got like one more track or something to come. Yeah, there's one called Goliath. It's sort of like doom metal with um, me doing like mumble rap. <laughs> <laughs> you should be a salesman. That's the, way, that's the way I describe it. I do actually sing in the chorus, but the verses I'm doing mumble rap. Right. Yeah. So cool. it's actually something to look forward to. Yeah, it's different. But, but after this, I'm I'm really like I like these recordings, but. I really want to get back to, before I get too old, I want to get back to some serious grooves and beats. Like that's what Head Like a Hole was all about, was about great beats, great grooves that make people move. And you need to have a certain tempo in the songs. It's not all, the, the tempo of do, 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 do gets a little bit boring. It needs to be a bit more, do, 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 you know. There's nothing wrong with having slower songs in your um, in, in your arsenal, definitely, because I mean it's a, it's important to have a sort of a variety of BPMs and a variety of energy in a live show. Yeah. But you do need those kind of core jumping up and down songs, and it would be good if you didn't have to revert to the very old catalogue uh, for for your live shows to sort of fill fill that gap. It'd be good to have a couple of new ones. Yeah. yeah. At the moment, the set is a best of, and we could probably do a George Thorogood and play the same albums till we die. I mean, he made a living off it. He, he still is. He only plays two albums, I think, or one album. All right, cool. Uh, I guess we should we should bounce on to the next question. We met at an airport one day, and I was heading back to Auckland from a driving job, and we sat and chatted yep. about this and that in the uh, waiting lounge area. At, at the yep. time, you were starting up tattooing, and uh, since I've seen a, a lot of your work online, you seem to be a bit of a natural when it comes to doing that profession. Yeah, straight out of school, I went up to art school in Auckland, and... I actually wanted to go to art school for four years and become a painter, but I I failed miserably there. So I went to um, the next big thing, which was um, Whitecliffs. Back then, Whitecliffs didn't have such a great name. Um, Greg Whitecliffe was still there. So I went there for a year and did like a fine arts uh, diploma because it was only for a year. But I tried to get into Elam while I was there. I got an interview, but I didn't get called back. So... You know, when that when that all ended, that's when I came back to Wellington and started up Head Like a Hole, and I sort of, the art sort of became part of Head Like a Hole because we always did 
all of our artwork in house, so me and Nigel would do it together. But I never really continued to. I did a few life drawing classes, and I thought I was going to continue on and keep doing art, but it sort of faded off. But when I when he like a whole lot back together, and we did the tattoo festival, and I was just walking around thinking I'm going to get a few tattoos, you know, because I haven't really got many tattoos. Why well, I didn't anyway back then. So I started getting some, and I just saw, you know, this dude. Vaughan Morris, Capity tattoos, and I thought I'm going to hit him up. I'm going to see if I can get it. How hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> How hard can it be to tattoo someone? Surely, um, I'm going to hit him up and see if I can get an apprenticeship. And I managed to secure that. And then I found out, okay, so it is quite difficult <laughs> um, initially. Once you get it in your head that these few things that you need to get right to execute a tattoo. Um, then you need to realise um, how to do a good tattoo. Right. So uh, I've been, I don't know, tattooing now for probably only three years. And professionally, uh, dare I say professionally, not even a year, dude. And, and how's, it, how's it all going? Are, are you really enjoying it? Because it, it looks like you are. I, I love it. I just wish I had more. There's just so many tattoo artists now. Everyone wants to be a tattoo artist. There's an ad on Facebook and Instagram every fucking minute saying, hey, you can be a tattoo artist too, dude. You know, all you need to do is do my design course and you can draw tattoos. And then, you know, there's tattoo schools where people, there's classes of people tattooing fake skin to become tattoo artists because tattoos are just the norm now. So You do have to be really careful about sort of, paying too much close attention to the algorithms on Facebook because, for example, I'm in some drummer groups and because and every now and then the, I type the word drum or symbol, yeah. the, the, the algorithm goes, well, let's just throw everything we've got yeah. at this dude. So, so some, some the, 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 yeah. the, the algorithm can give you a false sense of reality. Like, like, as you said, everyone's a tattooist. But from my Facebook window, no one's a tattooist or barely anyone's a tattooist. So... Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, like I, I've, I've I've been trying to follow certain things, and now I just have feeds that are full of Randy Rhodes <laughs> and Wasp. You should definitely sort of stick to your guns and do do uh, tat- tattooing. It, it seems to be like a natural yeah. thing for you. Not every tattoo artist finds their style straight away. You know, it may take them years to draw what they really want to draw and to tattoo what they really want to tattoo. Some tattoo artists overnight, boom, are in the pocket doing exactly what they want to do because there's tattoo artists and then there's artists, there's tattoo artists that are artists, you know, but then there's tattoo artists that aren't artists. After we chatted in the departure lounge, we boarded the plane and for some weird reason our assigned seats were right next to each other. That that was was pretty (laughs) fucking odd. (laughs) So during, during the flight to Auckland, you mentioned the documentary that uh, was about to be released and told me stories from that time. I just yeah. recently watched that documentary on, uh, on the weekend in preparation for this, and it filled in a lot of gaps in the band's overall history for me, uh, particularly things like yeah. the, the disbanding. I didn't even know that you'd actually broken up because I, I, I was living overseas and totally missed all that. Um, and, of course, the heavy drug use, which was quite difficult to watch. You didn't know about that either? <laughs> no. Well, I mean... <laughs> Let's say you you know that your girlfriend slept sort of slept with a guy. There is a difference between hearing about it and actually watching them at it. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Well, well, when we talked about this, Julian did say, you know, that I've got that footage from that house in Dunedin where I shot you guys shooting up, and I was like, really, you've still got that? And he goes, yeah, mate. And he goes, it's and we watched the whole thing, and it's brutal, like. It's really mm. confronting. So when we put that little bit in and you can see that little piece of plastic in my mouth or in Nigel's mouth, but you can't see what he's doing, but you can. It's, it is it is quite confronting. But yeah. when, when we first talked about it, Nigel was like, what's all, mate? Let's just put it all in there. Let's put it all in there. And as soon as we went to see it, as soon as it came out, Nigel was like, oh, my God, what have I done? He was yeah. freaking out. And I was like, it's too late now, dude. Like, and it's that thing of... Well, you've lived the life, so you can't look back on it and go, wish I didn't do it, because it's happened. To be honest, as a fan of you back in the early days, it was a very difficult thing for me to watch. 
to see a band with so much potential sort of basically crumble oh. under the weight of its own ego and addiction. So, so how did Dude, how how did you actually feel when you watched it for the first time? Oh, there was bits I wanted to walk out on. Like I couldn't actually watch myself because I looked like just a fucking whale. Um, it was just ridiculous back then. I just I mean, there's been periods in my life where I've just gone, I just don't care what I do and what I look like, and I wish I had. Um, this is probably one of them, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking the um, same thing. There's a few bits that I was, I felt a bit weird about, but there was a few bits that I didn't know about, like when Andrew Duno says, if I'd seen Booger any sooner, I just would have punched him in the face, and I was like, what? Me? What for? What have I done? And I think he edited it wrong. I think that came before I accidentally sent the email, which made him quit. It didn't make sense in the movie to me, maybe uh, yeah, when I think about it, because I don't actually have a copy, believe it or not. Probably just as well, though. It's it, it, it's it's not really a casual watch, you know, on a Sunday afternoon. It's quite heavy, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that whole, you know, the whole thing of me in hospital. Yeah. I didn't, in the first yeah. edit, that was a whole lie. What? The first, the first edit, it said that it was a, and it was, Advertised as a self-inflicted axe wound. Okay, but it was actually um, a relapse. It was probably from from like a bad needle or something, was it? Yeah, yeah it was. Um, and um, I didn't want anyone to know about it. So, especially the band and even my wife, <laughs> uh, which yeah, she didn't take too well. So yeah, that, that sort of thing's hard to watch. Um, but in the, when the band ended in 2000, the sad thing is, is that after Gerald died, the band actually gained momentum. Like Tom Watson in the movie says that we had all this opportunities and, and it all fell apart and me and Nigel ruined it. And it's like, no, 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 dude, that's bullshit. After Gerald died, it actually got better and better and better and better up till we ended. It only went south because Nigel spent all the money and we couldn't go back overseas. Because Gerald oh. died, and we could have gone back overseas if we'd had money, and, and someone else was managing us. But we had a few managers that yeah, sort of dicked us, and um, and then when it came to quitting, I just got to a point where I was like, I can't continue on playing shows around New Zealand, and every time we go on the road, all I'm worried about is how I'm going to get high. And this was my massive ego. I thought that I was holding the band together. Everyone was expecting we're going to do something stupid on stage and keep the band rolling along with the, their um, crazy ways. And I was just like, I'm, I'm sort of done. I just want to stand there and look at the crowd. And that's how it ended. People were like, what's happening? He's just standing there. Maybe we should talk about uh, about the future. So what, what's on the horizon for, for Head Like a Hole? Is it is it still quite, well, quite hard to get everything moving? Or Yeah, it is, dude. Like, Goliath's going to be released hopefully in like 10 days. I just need to confirm the artwork and stuff. Um, and then after that, it's just a case of we really need to have regular rehearsals and I really want to hear something that's going to make me take notice, you know. I just want, I want to hear something that I'm like, dude, I, want, I actually actually want to truly write something great, you know. Peppy riffs. Yeah, I want to hear some something unusual, you know, just – and something that makes me go, well, because I'm a huge metalhead, so I'm not adverse to going even more that direction than sort of dark and moody. I'd be more inclined to go metal and downy, you know? Right. It chugs along live, you know? Like, Hoot Nanny's got a great riff. Faster great hooves. Riff. Yeah, faster hooves. Just <laughs> let, riff, riffs, dude. Memorable riffs. Mm. I like Demons. Yeah, I think it's a good song, but is it the sort of song that's going to stay in people's mind? You know, is it memorable? Is it a, is it truly great? You know, sort of thing. It's got it does have some catchy lyrics to it, and it does it does it does have a, a good groove to it. But yeah, de definitely live. You know, I think you do need a couple of couple of faster new tunes. Wouldn't wouldn't be uh, wouldn't, wouldn't go yeah. amiss. You know, since end of life, we haven't had anything. It's um four years. It sounds like you've you you got some homework to do. Maybe have some Zoom meetings with the with the band and sort of like 
put those ideas forwards and see if anybody can yeah. sort of go away in, into their little corner and come back with something good. I agree. Yeah, I, I really want he'd like a whole to think about what we're writing and what we're trying to do with the songs, and we need to write them so people are moving. You know, like thinking, what is it going to do to the listener? Yeah, mm. write a few of those. So I just think more more time spent together. That's my thing. I've always said recently. I've always said the least less and less time we spend together, the less and less we will be a band. All right. Well, I, I guess we should prob- probably wrap it up as we're probably pushing pushing the limits of people's patience. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for uh, chatting with me tonight, and uh, I'm looking forward to the. The good new racy track that you that you've yet to yet to create. It's out there somewhere, mate. Like I'm looking at it. You guys can definitely pull it off. I mean, you're you're all good good musicians, and I you know I I believe in you, man. I believe in you. Yeah, I reckon we can channel it. All I need to do is, like you said, zoom in. I just want to say, what what's everyone's direction? What do everyone want to get out of this? And what musical direction would you like to take? All right, we're gonna have a have a wonderful evening, and uh, yeah, yeah, mate, you I'll, uh, I'll be in touch, I guess. Yeah, cool. Cheers. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for watching. See you later. See you, man.